Hi, welcome back to part 14 of this series of videos on Doge encoding. Uh, so we've had a bit of a break because we were uh, working on the release notes for Dogen. We just uh, managed to get um, version 19 out of the door. Now it took us a lot longer than expected with the release notes because there's so much stuff to talk about. Uh, hopefully this will be a bit of a shorter uh, release uh, cycle, this one. Um, now that work is more under control. Uh, so when we left, last left off uh, on part, um, oh by the way, let me just mention in case you haven't noticed, uh, if you go to the Doja projects, uh, just refresh this, you can see the release notes and the releases, and with the release notes you get a little demo here, and also a nice link to the, to this series of videos, uh, you can find that there. Uh, so when we last uh, on part 13, we were trying to connect the dots and go back to the relational model because we had spent so much time faffing with other bits and pieces, really. Um, we, on top of that, we had all sorts of problems with um, trying to create the file tracer. Now, some of you mentioned uh, you know, that one of the reasons why you spend so much time faffing file tracer is lack of tests. And to some extent it's true, really we should have more better tests for this. Um, however, um, just bear in mind that we don't really have a lot of time to work on, on Dogen. Uh, when we started, and, and one of the reasons why you see so many tests still here, um, if I go to the dashboard, now we seem to have lost our builds from uh, our generated tests. I've already started an investigation on that. So let's not spend some time on this. But um, yeah, as you can see, there's about 464 tests at present. Um, we used to have a lot of manual tests, and we used to always do uh, first write the test, you know, test driven. Um, we ended up stopping uh, that approach actually, because the problem was every time Dogen is sort of an uh, experimental research project, and uh, it has changed dramatically over the last few years. And uh, what we found is that every time we learned the lesson, we needed to refactor the code. We, we'd have to spend almost as much time refactoring the tests as we had spent refactoring the code. And that would be fine if this is, this is our main job, because um, you're really getting paid to make sure the code base is in good shape. But it's a bit demoralizing when it's your part-time hobby thing that you spend most of your time, literally 50%, sometimes more, uh, writing test code and refactoring test code instead of actually getting on with the things you want to work on. So we, I decided to reach a compromise where um, we have high-level tests that we consider to be really, really important, uh, and those high-level tests are mainly related to um, um, to what we have in uh, to what we have in engine, really, uh, which is a sort of high-level orchestration in Dogen, and those tests really validate that the code generation comes out exactly as you'd expect, um, literally binary-wise. So if there's anything that the code generation uh, generator used to generate in one way and generates in another, um, those tests will fail. And and what we do with those tests is we check that every Dogen model generates exactly as it generates here, and we check that um, every reference model, uh, these guys here, generate exactly as you get there. And um, if, you, if you break uh, code generation, then immediately for every commit, you'll see immediately that um, the tests, those tests will stop passing. Um, so if you keep an eye on tests, and if any of these things stops being green, uh, that then tells you the code generator has changed. That does not necessarily mean that you've actually broke something. It may have been that you've done it on purpose. You just forgot to update the reference tests, reference models, or test. But those tests are kind of high-level tests, and they have very low maintenance because you can change the whole of the internals of Dogen, and um, none of the tests will break, uh, presumably, unless you broke something. Um, so that, that's actually quite a good thing because it means that um, we almost spend no time at all managing low-level tests. Of course, the disadvantage of that is uh, when you want to test a component like the tracer, for example, um, you you know, you ideally you really want the functionality of the tracer being tested with a tracer test so that when we do something like create the file tracer, um, we immediately pick up uh, the exact break. But then, of course, every time the file trace interface changes, then you go and have to update the test. Um, so that sadly, we just don't have the time to do that. Um, so I, I'm not saying that I disagree with test-driven development. I'm just saying that um, 
you have to uh, consider your trade-offs when you in development it's all about trade-offs and uh, it's very important that you do the right trade-offs if we spend most of the time writing tests we probably will eventually stop actually writing dojain because we just consider this to be a boring activity and we end up not working on it anymore so motivation would go down so that that would be not a good thing really so you just have to balance things um, depending and target your uh, whatever audience or whatever uh, task that you're trying to do so that's the reason why we don't have a nice test for the tracer that will give you um, exactly the feedback we needed uh, on the previous uh, video um, it's not always the case that we don't write these sort of low-level tests. It's just that um, the old parts of the system all have these kind of tests. The new parts don't, because of this continual refactoring they've been in. Um, once the the core stabilizes, uh, I will actually start thinking about writing some tests, because uh, the other thing as well is that um, a system is not always being fundamentally rearchitected. We think that the architecture we got right now satisfies all the use cases and the use cases we've seen on the backlog, which is which is quite a lot. Uh, we have hundreds of stories in the backlog, so um, you know we're convinced that the architecture now kind of makes sense. Um, and once we move to the new world, uh, it is more or less understood that this architecture will it's not going to change dramatically, really. Um, so at that time, it probably makes sense to start doing some tests. It doesn't make a lot of sense whilst you're still hunting for this architecture because it is very expensive to maintain a proper trust-driven development um, approach. So that's kind of the rationale why we um, end up faffing a little bit. <coughs> of course, the downside of it is you end up spending um, sometimes a fair amount of time trying to understand why something is not working instead of having a nice test with a, a nice assertion that basically tells you exactly why something is broken. So hopefully that will make more sense uh, to those that were questioning uh, the lack of tests. Um, now, if we go back to what we're trying to do here. Um, so, where we left things off. Um, let's just start the clock as well. And we are working. Uh, no, we have started the clock. Um, so, oh, and the other thing I'd like to mention as well is if you want to get in touch uh, with the projects, I mean, we don't really tend to have many developers coming around, but if for whatever reason you'd like to uh, get in touch, make sure you check the. I uh, can't really see very much from here, but I just go over to uh, the UI, I guess. Um, you can always uh, contact, of course, via the issues as you would with any GitHub project. But we also have a GitHub channel, it's very, very quiet, uh, but you know, you can always say hi to us on GitHub will be there. Um, and uh, so uh, as I was saying, what we did before is we created a file tracer. I mean, we met for about an hour session today. And what the objective is to try to see if we can connect to a, a relational database and um, just dump something in there. That would be quite a cheerful thing to do. So we created a file tracer that had exactly the same interface as the, the tracer. And if you remember the reason why we had all those problems, I'm just going to put side by side the file tracer and the, uh, and the tracer. Um, we had all those troubles because when we did the copy and paste exercise, we attempted to keep the, the detection of whether the tracer is enabled or not in the top level tracer and then delegate to the, the individual backends uh, as required. Now, sadly, uh, the, the logic of tracing is very interwoven with the, um, the decision of tracing enabled or not. Um, there's a lot of magic here. So what we'll do is n we will look at that later. For now we we'll just keep this logic where each backend has exactly the same logic detecting whether tracing is enabled or not, uh, which is really not what you want. Um, and once, we, um, once we're happy enough that everything's working, uh, what we'll do is we'll slowly um, carefully migrate the logic to the top level tracer. If you remember the tracer contains the different uh, backend tracers I guess <coughs> the trial tracer and the relational tracer. So really you want the tracer to have that logic not, not, the, not the child tracers I guess. Um, so what we'll do then today is we will try to get the relational tracer um, to trace something really simple um, such as the variability model, I believe. Um, before we go any further, as I always mention, it must be a bit boring now, but uh, 
you should always try to refresh your uh, your models. Uh, it's a bit annoying, but uh, once you lose work because of this, then uh, or once you spend hours debugging something because of this, you start to appreciate that this is a something you should do. Um, particularly when we uh, we keep changing uh, laptops. Uh, So we have the assets model here, the variability model, uh, profiles which we probably to be fair don't need, and the tracing model which I guess we it's going to be the main bit where we're going to be working on. Uh, now for the demos I tend to use 150 so you can see things from far away, but to be honest it's very n annoying to code with such a high resolution. Uh, so um, s apologies, but um, I'll keep this as a small screen. These videos are not really designed for you to watch on a TV, I'm afraid. Um, so, if you remember, we started by adding some kind of helper. I guess we'll be here somewhere. There we are, the relational adapter. And we were tr still experimenting at what exactly that meant, but we knew that we needed to adapt something like a feature model. And then, what we also kind of guessed was that um, in the tracer, we needed something like um, a start chain and a start transform um, that took on the responsibility of writing the data to the database. Um, now, of course, these guys here are templated, but uh, as, as is the tracer, the file tracer, sorry, but the relational tracer won't be templated. So. Um, what we want to do then is we want to say something like um, start chain, start chain, start chain. So let's just have a quick look at the variability transforms and see. Okay, as you can see here, we have a few chains here. And the chain take a feature model. We also have feature model production chain. And that takes just the context which is this chap here which is interesting as well I don't... Th oh, we forgot to open the relational model <coughs> apologies that my code is still not quite fixed so the relational model doesn't seem to really have the notion of a context to be fair the context is more or less constant for the transforms, not supposed to be changed um, but um, it would be nice to be able to have some kind of an idea of the context. So if, if I take variability as an example, the transform context contains a lot of useful information like the data directories, the archetype locations, compatibility, and the tracer, which is not that relevant. Um, so I think really what we want to do is to say a transform a transform as a context um, and the context could just be JSON really couldn't it I mean we could just dump the context as JSON into the database Postgres is very nice in that sense uh, I don't think we've set the table um, the content type to be the right type so it's just text but we will use JSON B once we finished um, that's not too hard to do. So I think what we should do for that is we should try to have a JSON so a transform has a context. <coughs> it is a bit annoying that we're going to end up writing the context hundreds of times um, but um, to be truthful that is what we're doing at the moment. We're supplying the context uh, to the transforms. So, sorry, apologies. <coughs> So, uh, so these two cases here, and this guy here seems to be returning a list of metamodel feature, and then finally a feature model. So clearly we also need to somehow model the notion of a metamodel feature as an input. And now a relational adapter. 
So what we'll do then is we will adapt our context. So that's a meta model. Oh no, sorry, uh, transforms, isn't it? We'll adapt to transforms context. Again, we don't really know what we're adapting this into. Uh, and we will adapt um, to a list of features. And again, we don't really know what we're adapting this either. So there we are. That seems like enough to cover the majority of the things we are going to see in the the relational, uh, sorry, the variability model. Um, and we will start by the context, and I think a context can be updated to. Interestingly, we have the notion of a transform. Perhaps it makes sense for the transform to have a context. In which case, um, we just create a transform. That could just adapt to a string and then... Uh, Okay, that, that looks about right. We will just leave that as, as it is, for now anyway, and then we will go back to that. Um, so now then, uh, that's the simplest thing we can do here. We can do a start chain. Yeah, we can do a start chain that uh, creates a transform of type chain with some kind of information in it. That seems like a nice thing to do. and. For that, we would need to connect to a database, and then um, now, if you think about this, we we as a tracer. So, if you look at how the tracer gets constructed, um, if I just do something like context factory, uh, something like this. Well, to be honest, we probably want the CPP. I forgot to put my uh, coding gloves, as my kids call it. are quite helpful for those of us coding for long periods of time. So as you can see here we're creating a tracer here and we've got access I believe to the configuration which is this chap here. That contains everything we need um, things such as uh, database uh, settings, uh, the format, uh, sorry the type of, uh, of the backend for, for the tracing. So in here we can easily set up the configuration for the database. Um, we also have to be very careful when we do this that we don't. Um, we, n we need to remember that relational model is not enabled in all builds. If you recall, we don't have ODB on, on a all of our uh, build machines, so uh, we still need to cater for the case where ODB is not available. Um, so for now, we have a macro for that. So we need to uh, ensure that we only include the, the right headers and the right logic, depending on whether ODB is available or not. Uh, so what we'll do then is we will... It's our first task for the day. We're just going to try something really simple, which is to connect to a database and just write uh, one of these relational objects. It seems like a simple thing that we can probably do in a couple of hours. Today is the final of the Copa Libertadores, so... Um, we're going to have a short session, I'm afraid. Um, right then, um, where were we? Relational Tracer needs to do a start chain. It also needs to have a database connection and it needs to be supplied to the Tracer. And so let's just have a look at how the Tracer is initiated. Here is the Tracer takes the configuration, is the share pointer, and presumably the tracer internally just contains a file tracer. Okay. Um, right, this is not really the most brilliant logic, really, because if this was an interface, we'd, we would be able to do something much more flexible than just have the one tracer, because we don't really need to have both tracers at the same time. Um, 
it's going to be heavily macroized code. What we can do actually, just to make life slightly easier, is we can try to hide the database logic all inside of the relational tracer. And then we can always initialize the rate relational tracer, but if the database is not available, we can just basically uh, do a dev null. It's basically say, um, you know, throw or whatever it is. And so that the macros are only going to be in one place. Otherwise, we end up scattering the macros everywhere. And um, that's just not nice. Um, so we could basically say that the, the tracer here could receive. So we've got already the tracing configuration, which is good. But um, clearly, we need the database configuration, which is this chap here. And so if we supply both of these, and depending what the user's requested, uh, we can make the tracer a pointer. In fact, we could even have an impul just to make life even easier, and the impul is behind the macro. So we're just going to use a pattern in C++ called the pimple pattern, which is a private impul. Um, inside of the, f the relational tracer, and then we have two different relational traces, one which is a dev null that does nothing, or throws or something like that, and uh, we make that responsible for all of the logic, and we have another one which is uh, the act one that actually does the stuff and then we just have the macro in one place and that's probably the clearest thing you can do uh, now notice that the tracing configuration is optional and we literally just delegate, just deport it onto the file tracer, so it's really not much of an option at the moment. Uh, which is fine, I mean, like I say, this is just the first stab at this, it doesn't really matter, we can hack anything really. Just don't The first thing you want to do is to see things connecting to things, right? So uh, we'll start with that. Um, let's just get our hands into the relational tracer. We haven't done anything yet at the moment in the relational tracer, so um, let's just look at the file tracer side by side with the relational tracer. We're going to need a similar ish interface. Um, probably not stack, list, map, optional. There's a lot of stuff here. Perhaps optional, and then perhaps um, a tracing configuration, I guess and also a database configuration no file, no metrics, no metrics builder and then if you could say something like um, this does not have to be explicit could just be um, most optional of the tracing configuration this we could call tcfge and then we could also have a boost optional of the database. The reason why these things are optional is because you're propagating the fact that they're optional in the configuration. So the users don't have to necessarily supply these things. Um, and if you call this the dbcfg. So with this, we probably have enough, it doesn't have to be explicit, because there's two parameters. And now, as I said, we're just going to try the simplest possible thing, which is, well actually, probably add initial input, I guess. Um, and initial input in our relational model. Again, we don't seem to uh, map that to anything. So what is an initial input? Add initial input. Ah, interestingly, it's just an I-oval. Okay, see this, this template interface was brilliant for strings, but uh, it is actually really annoying when you want to know the types of things. So, uh, initial input. So the initial input is this um, ALRP here which is just the archetype location repository. Now this is part of our archetype model. Uh, which is 
guy here. This model that still requires a little bit uh, of cleaning up. Uh, started the cleanup, but uh, we haven't gone very far yet. So you can see here there's a location repository. And this is what we're dumping. And this tells us about all the features that are available and the locations of those features. Um, These, these types are not overly complicated, to be honest. Uh, these locations they are very, very simple. A uh, group of locations. And then we have the repository part. And I think it's almost... <coughs> it is almost always the case that we just want to have a quick look at what's available in terms of features. I don't think we ever actually bother to query on any of these things. <coughs> uh, so what we'll do is, to cater for this case, um, as you can see here we have the notion of a run. Excuse me. <coughs> and um, Ah, in fact, we may have done this already. So you see here, there's a notion of a run and a notion of a configuration. And I believe the configuration should probably be the initial inputs. Probably uh, renamed it. Ah, oh, look, interesting. We've already done the mapping to JSON B here, which is quite nice. I just suspect we should do exactly the same thing here. Or actually, I wonder if it's here or where it's used. Yeah, in fact, that's where it is. You need to do that way. It's, it's a bit of a shame, isn't it? Because then you have to declare this everywhere. So um, I'm just going to take the executive de decision of saying, populate a run. And we, um, with the run, we populate the configuration. And then that, that's how we initialize this. Um, that, that seems good enough to me. So, uh, we're going to make the initial add initial input as our first database operation. Now, um, in this particular case, as it happens, um, std string is perfectly fine. And we will just say, well, std string would do. Of course, you need a string. You should always uh, make sure you add uh, headers that you depending on. Right, so there you are. Something really, really, really simple. Um, as our starting tracer. Uh, one thing that I always notice is that if you change an include file, um, clang D always gets a little bit upset. So then, what we're going to do with our relational tracer then is going to be something as simple as this. We're going to say, uh, of course I did mention the pimple, didn't I? Uh, we need two different implementations, so just for now, since we started this, we'll just finish it. And leave it alone. Now, as I explained, uh, we can't just uh, come here and, and just do the um, assume that the relational model will be available because it might not be available. So what we'll do instead is we'll just um, if I just go to main probably uh, that's not main but command line options I guess. Yeah yeah so if I take config.hvp I never quite remember the name of this. Uh, well, here we are, config.hvp. And then, uh, if we do something like, um, well, to be honest, uh, if we just do something like uh, boost share pointer, uh, let's just do boost pimple, uh, not serialization, apologies. I don't really want a unique pointer. Just use uh, it. Yeah. And of course, if I click on that. So the pimple idiom, as you can see here, is very simple. I'm afraid um, 
I just uh, don't bother these days to remember every single detail in life. Um, I think Stack Overflow and Google are just so good that um, a lot of times I just uh, just remember where to look. Uh, when I started in programming, it was very common that uh, you needed to remember all the details. Um, I should like calling my pimple just pimple. Impl. So as you can see here, we have an impl. And what we'll do then is we'll basically do something like this. Um, namespace uh, if def then uh, let's just do lsb find definition. So if we have a relational model, well then we need an else clearly. We can have something like class um, impl. We did call it impl, didn't we? Yep. So for one case, we want the class impl to be one. Another case, we want the class impl to be another. And what we want to do is to say uh, something like. Impl the score. Well, of course, in these cases, you probably should just do uh, includes uh, boosts make share, uh, and we can just simply do boosts make share of impl, and then we want to make sure that our impl does exactly what we do. Something like this. Um, and that's a very trivial constructor we got here. Our beloved um, Clang D seems to be stuck. It may even be oh yeah. which we got a packet here. Right, so then now you can see we got two different types of impulse. Uh, of course, these impulse will need constructors and match our constructor. So, if we uh, just create a constructor here, something like uh, one thing that's useful sometimes is just to make these anonymous namespaces part of your main namespace, just to avoid having to uh, do usings everywhere. Uh, and now here, of course, you don't really want the info. You want the actual, well, the actual implementation. Now I suspect these uh, functions are going to get really big and complicated. So what we'll do is we will we will not bother with the definition here. Uh, we'll just give them a little bit below. But there you are. So. Um, we have this impl with two variables and then we need to add the initial input. And predictably we will have similar method here and a similar method here. And now we can simply delegate to the impl and we can say something like input ID inputs. Hopefully uh, the impl right, this is quite interesting. I wonder is because we declare the impl inside the class. Right, okay, so as you can see here, it's expecting our impl to be defined inside the class. Um, let's see what... Right, okay, so apparently we need to uh, scope this. Um, to be inside the class, yeah, yeah, 
This is all stuff that uh, sadly my uh, old programmer brain So uh, apparently you can't use anonymous namespaces. See if you if you don't use an anonymous namespace, the problem we have is if we have an impulse somewhere else with exactly the same name, uh, that would be a problem. But it's not too bad because remember we're inside of the class, so probably this is not going to cause any linking issues. Right, so very very simple approach here. Um, now everything to do with database stuff can go in here except for the headers, so we need to make sure that uh, we remember to add all of our includes in there. And everything that's not to do with databases, including perhaps throw, could be done there. And we probably already have an exception for tracing, tracing error. We can just reuse that. So let's just look for a throw exception. And let's just look for the trace uh, .cpp. And if you could just get the oh the logger as well on the tracing error. Righty. So with this, we are more or less armed. Uh, let's just start by defining our logger as well. Can't really do much without logging in though, Jen. So tracing .relational tracer. to go. Now then, uh, this is getting a little bit more exciting now. Uh, so what we really want to do now is to try to figure out how to connect to a database using ODB. Oh no, actually uh, we have a problem. We haven't changed the tracer interface, so we probably should start with that. Um, so what we want to do here is to say we need a database configuration. And we need to supply some database options. As you can see here. And now we no longer need explicit because we have more than one. And then uh, we need to create a relational tracer. Now, of course, um, we don't really want to always create a relational tracer, um, which is a bit annoying. So presumably you're going to need a pointer. And this is not really nice because, as you can see, we now have a pointer for the impl, a pointer for the relational tracer itself. Um, this is a bit too many pointers for my liking. Um, perhaps what we can do is we can say that the relational tracer is an interface. And then um, we have a make tracer. That is clever enough to determine um, what to do. And the impulse are implementations of those interfaces. So uh, I'm just gonna, I mean, this you have to bear with me here because we're just thinking off the cuff here. But uh, let's just imagine that class uh, relational trace is actually uh, an interface. Um, and then you have something like make relational tracer that turns you a relational tracer pointer. Uh, and it's presumably a static function. And you call this function by supplying the options, and it will return you uh, one of these chaps. Um, this now becomes a virtual void. Virtual void uh, with that. And we must make sure this guy's not final, of course. And now you say, well, we don't really need a private state. Now we're not going to bother returning a shared pointer because um, it's up to the 
we give the ownership of the pointer to the, the guy that's going to be at the other end. It's not our job to determine what to do with it. Um, in fact, this is really where C++ is um, a nice language. We can just make this a function. Because really, think about it, this is not really part of the relational tracer interface, is it? It's just a function. Uh, and we can just say, okay, create me a relational tracer, pass me these arguments, and that looks a bit nicer, doesn't it? And then we could say, okay, we have two implementations of this, um, and now you'll see how this will look a lot better, because now we can say, uh, now we can say something like, uh, so mm, that's the no implementation, I guess. Because it was just doing nothing most of the time. And this will be the... Um, I don't know. Let's just call it the relational impl for now. I mean, it's not a very good name, but bear with me. Um, right, so we have two implementations here. Uh, we could just say that your virtual override you too. Very good time. And uh, this chap here now becomes our relational tracer pointer. Does make relational tracer. Righty. Now then. Don't need make share anymore. And these guys here will be slightly different. Okay, I. You may disagree with me here, but I just liked the the notion here where um, and let me just work on this before I start talking again. So what we want to do here is basically say use one or the other implementation of this interface. So here we want to say return new the actual import. Um, oh. Right, so ah, one thing to remember is that we're not in C sharp, so um inheritance must be public it's the problem of working with a lot of languages at the same time um, right so now we have two implementations uh, but as you can see this is some very very simple approach right um, no uh, now we move our SharePoint to this guy here We could say something like boost shared pointer of relational. Um, tracer. Uh, relational tracer. And what we'll do, I mean, as you can imagine, we this is the first draft of this, so uh, it doesn't really matter what you do, just get something up and running quickly. All we want to do today is to connect to that database, so it's not, not about writing something absolutely perfect. So um, Now, of course, you probably say, well, we don't want to always build a relational tracer, do you? And that's a good point, right? We don't want to um, always create a relational tracer if the configuration doesn't request it. So um, what we really want to do is something like... Um, well, we always create the file tracer because that's just the way things are at the moment. But, um, so if we have a configuration, that's the first thing, of course. And Actually, do you know what I'm going to do? Um, I'm going to always... I was going to say, I'm going to always create a relational tracer, but actually that's not a good idea because remember, we need to determine when to forward to the relational tracer. 
Um, and we only want to forward the relational tracer if the tracer is enabled. Now, y y by now we probably have already figured it out that um, we need to create an interface. We need to create a proper interface. And we need that interface to then implement both the file tracer and the database tracer um, somehow. Don't ask me how exactly that would work because remember, we need strings for one and we need a relational model for another. But um, the, the problem we've got at present is we, d we don't want to be all the time doing ifs and buts, right? What we really want is a tracer that just does something. It just traces. If you, if you ever, um, if you ever um, watched uh, Mike Acton, uh, it, it, he has got lots of interesting videos. He talks lots about um, data-oriented design. And what he mentions a lot is that if your code is full of ifs, you're literally flushing the cache all the time. So if, you, if your code is full of things like this, and and this, well I can't see it here but you'd see it in the file tracer. If you keep saying if else, if else, then y you're just wasting a lot of cycles by giving the computer the, the pipeline uh, the option of left or right. And um, it's just not a good idea. What you want to do is you want to do one if at the beginning of your logic. And then you want the rest of the entire logic to just basically be, you must do this, you must do this. So if you've gotten tracing not enabled, then you should really have a null tracer. And if you have tracing enabled, then you should have uh, the appropriate tracer. And then, um, and then from then on, it should just always do the one thing. So this is really not a very good design. We have to revisit this properly. We will just do the first take here, and then we'll just clean this up because it's not a very good idea to implement it this way. Right, so if we have a configuration, and if CFG um, oh, we are already in tracing, so we must have something like a backend here. Tracing backend is the relational database. Uh, of course, we then do a So as I said, this is just going to be the very first uh, take on this. But really, ah, of course, remember we um, we don't want to do a make shared. We want to actually say a relational trace is equal to uh, share point of relational tracer of the make relational tracer. And then here we can just basically say. Ah, remember that we uh, have two different configurations now. Importantly. And so we need to say something like this. So for the file tracer we just need that. Uh, for the configuration we just need that. Uh, it's fine uh, to just whilst you're finding your way to just do whatever quickest hack you can do. I always do that. Um, don't worry about making things too polished. Uh, just get it to work first, and then once you've got something working, is um, you can tie your things up. If you try to think about every single permutation, you're not going to get any work done. So, if the backend is equal to the relational database, we want to say, well, go and create one of these relational databases, and away you go. And if you selected a relational database but that's not available, well. Then you have a problem, right? We should probably just throw, I guess, if that's what you selected and configuration is not available. We can just get this guy here to throw. Uh, so that looks good. And that's all done at the very beginning. And we can just add the initial input. Okay, cool. That is looking good. So let's just copy this logic here. We could say something like uh, no impl as you knew it. Well, you don't even have to go very far, do you? You just basically say um, relational. 
support. Let's see. It's got no relation support, I guess. And uh, for good measure, you can say exactly the same thing for all of these. So if you attempt to use the relational configuration on the doge and it does not have relational configuration, we will uh, just bomb out. Um, interesting enough, we don't seem to have clan B. Ah, the reason why we don't have clan B, of course, is because this macro is not is defined. So we'd have to test that. Um, so the gen compiled without. Relational support. Of course, you probably should just not even bother to show the option to the user, but um, uh, what we'll do as well for good measure is since we only have this uh, on that one case. Oh, apologies, we seem to have jump files here. Um, we were in the relational database tracer. So yeah, the, the reason why Dogen, uh, sorry, Clang D is not kicking in is because we don't have, um, we don't have uh, the macro is, is defined, so it's not kicking in. Uh, so what we'll do here is put all these chaps in namespace uh, anonymous. Don't really need it to export it. Okay, and now we have all these complaints. These functions are going to be slightly more complicated, so I guess we should implement them out of line. Right, as you can see here. And that should do it. For now, just to get uh, Clan out of our backs, Clan B, we'll just uh, comment these chaps out. Just want to see this code compiling, really. Right, now then, um, what have we got? We have two implementations of the interface. Uh, one that's uh, going to actually do something, one that doesn't. Uh, just rows and we, depending on whether a macro is implemented in, in or, uh, or defined or not, we choose which one to do. Uh, we also decide to create the tracer depending on which configuration we've got. Um, now, I'm actually going to make a slight change here. And what I'm going to do is, I'm actually going to say, we need to check whether um, the pointer is pointing or not when it comes to tracing, right? I mean, there's no other way to know. So what we'll do is, what we'll do instead of, um, instead of this clever logic, we could just check the pointer. So perhaps if we do something like, um, we call the relational tracer, the relational tracer would if the configuration does not say to create a relational tracer, it returns null. And then here, clearly against my previous advice, we just check the pointer. The pointer is pointing, of course, it's because the configuration is done. If the pointer is not pointing, it's because it's not done. So therefore, we just ignore it. So this is a quick hack that we can do to get this going. And then this can be fixed later. So we take this logic from here, we just call this guy. Now remember, this could be returning null. That's absolutely fine. We don't mind. And this guy here then does something very simple. He basically says, if there's a configuration, and, oh, so we can say, if there is no configuration, or, well, or obviously is because there is a configuration, but backend is not relational database, return, no pointer. 
That basically means that um, didn't really have to create anything, so we didn't bother. And now we can do again this hack of ours. We can do something as simple as if we're pointing, we can add the initial inputs. And now I never quite figured out how to say to client D just take the names as they are. Uh, just always have to do a bit of deletion though. So right, this this I know for sure you're gonna say this is a big hack, but um this is one way of doing it. And then for good measure, um you could of course basically say else file tracer. Um and uh, like I said this is a terrible way of doing things because as you can imagine, um these ifs and else's are gonna be every single time you're tracing the, the pipeline would have to decide one or the other and, and to be honest y this is a decision you make at the very beginning you know exactly which one is going to be there so it's really silly to be doing this for every single call on every single transform but um, let me just do this as a, as a quick way out just to get things up and running um, now then for good measure we could just basically say Adding initial inputs. Okay. And we can even say input ID. Right, so this is probably sufficient for our basic test. Um, let's see what the compiler says about this. What we're looking for here is just to, to be able to compile, really. Sadly, we're changing the tracer, and the tracer is um, a sort of a template interface, so every time we touch it, we, we rebuild the world. It's not very nice. Might another reason why um, this is not the proper way to do things. Uh, okay, uh, silliness here. Um, if you recall in C++, whenever you create an interface, you should always not forget to create virtual destructor and make sure when you implement the class that you also implement the virtual destructor Which could be as simple as well done nothing because we don't really have anything to destroy. It's a good another good reason to always do wall because of these kind of nice little tips tell you uh, you're shooting yourself in the foot. It's nice of the compiler to tell us. Okay, so not much is going to happen here, but um, right, make shared objects. Uh, right, so what's happening now is simply that we, um, uh, not quite this chat, but uh, it's one really annoyance of uh, fly check and fly make and compilation buffer is that um, it's not so easy to. Um, access the compilation errors. Right, so this guy is going to create a tracing configuration and presumably somewhere around here well, Okay, this is not very nice, we should have really included tracing configuration and the database configuration Relied on the fact that the tracer defines those. So, uh, how are we doing for time? Not too bad. Right, so now we are just going to create the database configuration. Seems to me we're not really doing very much 
with this configuration, so we'll just uh, do exactly the same as we've done for the other configuration and see what happens there. It also means that the, well, let's just close this buffer. If I go up to the configuration, configuration factory. Not so let me say is the context factory, of course. Uh, presumably, a tracer here. What? It just needs second parameter. Should be up, oh, of course, here. Coma database. Right. Now I suspect. the other line. Let's see what the compiler says now. As you can imagine we're not doing very much yet. Okay, we still seem to be lacking something here. Context factory. Yeah, uh, I think the problem is we have two of these chaps. Not sure why it's not coming up, but uh, there it is. Not sure why this didn't come up in there. Uh, should have, really. Got some linking issues and the uh, relational trace is not coming up. No, the reason why that happened is because we declared this guy is virtual. Um, you know, one good practice I think sometimes is to just make constructor itself. Um, uh, well, that looks very much like a pure specifier. I think, unfortunately, if you if you create a pure specifier you need to um, you will need to declare the destructor somewhere else if I'm not if I remember rightly. Uh, this is one of those old school C++ tricks where by uh, making your destructor virtual you're uh, sorry making it pure you will um, make sure that uh, the class is really abstract So, uh, just in case at some point we... I think it's a good practice actually. Always make, at the very top, make your destructor... If you're creating an interface, make sure your destructor is pure or virtual. So there's really no other option but to um, for this class to be abstract. Now then, yet another rebuild. <coughs> this is going to be really old as we continue this work. many rebuilds I think. So as I said the objective for today is something really simple. We just want to see something in the database. Right now then now we're starting to see interesting things, right? So as you can see here we have a sort of a, an attempt to convert location repository to uh, a string, which is what you wanted, right? So we enter the bit that we're interested in. Uh, the way that's gonna work I have to think about five minutes. So if you remember, in the past, um, for the tracer, for the file tracer, we relied on the fact that the file tracer uh, propagated the conversion to string with operator inserter all the way up to the um, file writer. Um, <coughs> so where are we? Where is the additional input here? Now we can't rely on that uh, for this particular use case. Um, it's not possible for us to do that. So we probably need in this particular case, we need um, to do something a bit more uh, obvious. Something like a string stream. And... And convert the input. Now, like I said, this is not absolutely the, brilliant, the most brilliant design. 
Um, we just need to get the string here somewhere. Yeah, so like I said, um, the current design, which is not a brilliant design, is relying on the fact that um, operator um, inserter is defined all the way up to the file stream. And because it's designed all the, it's, it's all the way in the file stream, um, what we do is we uh, we leave it for the last minutes to um, to convert something to a string. Now, now that I think about this, wouldn't it be really interesting if we defined another type of stream, which is a database stream, and that stream could take exactly the same, follow more or less the same logic, but then what we do is we implement operator inserter via our adapters, and that is in effect a call to our um, our adapter. So in other words, for every type, if we created as part of the relational adapter operator um, inserter, but against our own stream, a stream that we're going to define. Um, I know, of course, you're going to say it's not really a stream, but just bear with me a second. Uh, notionally it's a stream, it's a descendant of a stream. Uh, and then what's happening then is that um a bit of noise going on downstairs. Let me just put it on pause for a second. Right, um really the kids are causing havoc as usual. Um so what was I saying? Uh, it would be nice to have an, a stream. Oh well, less an idea to explore. Let's imagine there's a notion of a stream, something that is descends from um from a stream. And then those streams are implemented in terms of our adapters and they end up writing to a database. Um, that would then allow us to continue with the same logic of propagating everything up to the stream. Um, and then we just need for the stream to internally um, take those relational objects and connect to the database, right? This seems like a very promising idea. I think I think I'm going to have to whiteboard this a little bit, but it seems like a prom but interesting idea to, at any rate. Uh, if you remember, there used to be a, a database um, a library called Sosi, uh, and that, if I remember, let's see if we can find some documentation. If we look at this, I vaguely remember these chaps coming up with some kind of a. stream-based approach to database. Let's see if we can find some documents. SCC++ stream. Very remember area. So as you can see here, you can write the SQL. And this returns data. So it's not exactly that the way they've done it. But really what we're trying to say is that if we had like a stream that enables you to take some objects, and then when you redirect this, is actually writing to the database. Um, it's a very, very specialized form of stream, and it's really not, I think, how streams were meant to be used. But if we did have that, that would then mean that uh, we can continue the same logic that we have at present. Um, and that would be quite interesting, actually, because then we could even say. Yes, I think I think we need to explore this idea. I'm not gonna. Uh, this is sadly where the videos are a bit limited because we really need to think properly about these things. We'll ignore that for now. Um, so, right. So what we have now is that we seem to be struggling to convert this to a string. Uh, we do know that's possible because we are doing it for the file. Ah, sorry, apologies. I need to do it here. And this is what I mean by the difficulties of coding while talking in a video. Is, uh, your concentration levels are much, much lower. So you always end up um, making silly mistakes. Uh, quite costly. Such as this one. Um, so, I mean, again, we have to rebuild the whole thing. 
actually this is really gonna annoy me after a while <coughs> using these sort of header header libraries it's just too expensive in terms of rebuild especially something like tracer is used everywhere um, Population is any better than the other ones? It's not too bad. Right, so I finally got a compilation through. Uh, so where are we at this point in time? Um, we've got some kind of rerouting, re I guess you'd say, um, to the right tracer, and then we've got the right tracer then being determined based on whether we have. Uh, ODB installed or not, the relational model. Um, so what I'm going to do next is, well I think as I always say, um, make sure you commit to early commit often. So as far as I'm concerned this is compiling. Of course you should make sure the tests are running in passing. But if the tests are running in passing then um, hey ho, we're good to go. Just uh, make sure we close the clock. Okay, I can hear some noise downstairs. Let's turn the pause in the street. A bit challenging to do some coding work with kids, I'm afraid. Um, okay, so we're just going to say. Oh yes, we did. So tracing, comma engine. Uh, first step at implementing the relational tracer. And here we just uh, we just want to say something like models um, relational work on variability and tracing. I think it's mainly cosmetics and tracing, but there you are. So we have a nice and clean um, box here to start off from. So now what we're going to do is we're going to try to just use our credentials to connect to the database, just because that's a satisfying thing to do. Uh, in order to do that, we're just going to hop over to a project we had already. up here and if I just look very quickly here for perhaps <coughs> backend maybe let's try login I oh know these are types I'm sure we had some kind of basic um, connectivity to the database around here somewhere I have to bury me a little bit. Um, uh, so probably not touching code for a while. Engine seems like a kind of place I could have that. Uh, um, database factory. That sounds like the kind of chap that would be connecting to a database. And as you can see here, we seem to be doing some kind of connectivity. I see some proprietary project that I'm doing so for my company. I'd like to open source this actually, but it's not um, the state yet. And if I just take this bit here too, let's just close all these files here. Right, so, um, let's have a quick look. Um, we did not bother to create the constructor here. Oh, we did. Yes, we did. We just missed it. Right, so ODB um, is initialized more or less like this. We create a database. Uh, we choose the database type there. And then we seem to create a schema. But clearly this is not a good idea to be done every single time. 
Um, I will just leave it for now. Again, another quick hack. And <coughs> so what we'll do this is uh, we need both configurations really. So if we don't have TCFG, then we have a problem. And if we do not have DBCFG, we have another problem. And we will just throw. So no tracing configuration. And here we could say something similar. No database configuration. And just to get to clang the end of our backs. Let's just create some strings here. need some kind of validation uh, for the database configuration so uh, I think we have a configuration validator somewhere uh, it should be around here configuration validator okay let's have a look at what the validator is doing here. Right, so what we need to do here is to ensure, um, I'm going to bother with this right now, but we um, need to ensure the configuration is valid. So, um, oh, I forgot to start clocking again. Let's put here in our notes, um, adds uh, database, adds validation to database configuration in config oh key binding seems to still be a little bit off right we just leave it at that because otherwise we would be stuck there for a while so presumably if it got here the valid uh, configuration must be all right and now here what we we'll do is we we'll basically say something like well let's just use the configuration that you gave us, whatever that is. Presumably these fields are filled in, validator should have checked, the host, the ports, and everything else. Then we create a schema, and as I said this is not a brilliant idea, but we do it for now, and away we go. Now, um, you remember we started off with initial input, um, the slide snag here is we need to create a run with a run ID, an activity, a version and uh, the configuration and we even need a top level transform. So this is slightly different from what we've done so far with the tracer. Um, that's because with the tracer we could start anywhere really, we don't care. So presumably with the tr as in file tracer that is. Um, there is no start, initial start sort of thing. And we have these add initial inputs. But um, we just assume that the first start chain is the start. <coughs> now we can't do that anymore because um, what we are saying now is actually we need to know when we started. Um, the other problem as well, I think, is that we probably have more than one initial input. I don't think we only had initial input once. Although I only saw it once here. Let's just double check that actually, because at least in the past we used to have multiple of these. So that's the guy that we've seen 
context factory. That's the diagram. This is tracer. So okay, maybe the code has changed and now we only do that once. Which is convenient for our purposes because we actually could start to say, okay, um, begin or something like that, start run or something. We can rename this chap. Uh, let's just say that in our uh, agile. So consider renaming um, to uh, start run or some such name to align with relational model. Okay, something like this. Um, of course, remember we also need the top level transform. Um, and we need to remember the run because uh, what's going to happen now is that we're going to we're going to be writing to the the run everything is going to be against the run id so we need to remember that run id so there's some logic needed there um, right at this point in time we have a schema in the database of some kind presumably and we just want to write something for the run table so what we'll do is we will Try. Oh, actually, another thing to bear in mind, I think, is that if you tried to create a schema, there was a trick somewhere. I always keep on bumping into this problem. Let's just return to our uh, other projects. Um, so I haven't quite figured out how to use uh, Helm properly, to be honest. Now, one thing to bear in mind is really important. Um, there is some incantation you need to make sure you do, which is this guy here. You have to link with whole archive. If you do not do this, um, bad things happen. So that's because um, of some magic that ODB uses. So presumably this guy here is going to link against the relational lib. Now what we want to do is make sure the relational lib Okay, so okay, the magic has to occur above. If you do not do this, then uh, the sort of the magic of ODB is not going to trigger, and that's going to be a problem because you're going to have linking errors, and these are very, very strange linking errors. It could take you a while to debug this. Um, don't ask me how I know this. Um, and I don't even, I'm not even sure this is possible to do on Windows yet. Okay, so this this is important. Um, now, for good measure, we will try to um, some of these things. <coughs> we'll try to just create one of these objects in the relational model. Don't really need these guys anymore. Keep closing and opening these. <coughs> so, um, what we really want to do is to go to relational. Interesting that we have gen oh, Okay. Uh, Right, so then, um, relational, what we want to do here is we want to say, please include, well, the type, clearly. Let's just uh, try to construct our inputs uh, slowly, so you have the notion of a run. Now this is not going to be the only thing we need to include because we need to know of the run from an ODB perspective. And I don't know that you need all of the Postgres types as well. I think you do. So uh, we will just do something like this. These are all files generated by ODB. And Let's just uh, try to do something like this. Right, so what are we doing here? We're basically saying, well, we need some ODB related files and we need the dogen files. Um, and then this notion of a run. Now, of course, we're going to really heavily hack this run. As you can imagine, we're just trying to get something working, so 
it's going to be very mm, cr crude. So, uh, Dogen, Tracy, run, run, run dot ID, or oh, I don't know, ABC perhaps, run dot configuration, and this is where we need our input. Probably well, I don't know. Let's just say that's enough. Now, what pro have we got? And that ID. Ah, um, I think we probably were trying to be clever and created this type called run ID. Uh, so let's just do a run ID here. Similarly, we we'll probably try to be clever here and create some JSON type. And apologies, this should have been ID. And the JSON type is this guy. This is our attempt to use primitives, which is a feature of Dogen we quite like, but we don't tend to use very much. Then we. Ah, interestingly, we need to keep track of the database. Um, so perhaps we need something like private chat pointer of a database database. And did we get rid of make share? I believe we did. And probably need shared PTR2. Right, now then, um, what we really want to do at this point in time is wait for Clang D to catch up. Um, at some point today, we'll. Quite, uh, mm, session is taking quite a long time. We're on an hour and a half of recording already. Let's make sure we didn't stop. Oh, no, it's still recording, good. Uh, right, so what we're trying to do is, I'm tired of waiting for Clang B, so I'm just going to control G this. Um, so, uh, the idea then is to say, uh, one Clang D, database is equal to, uh, the make boost, make shit of, I don't know, something like ODB database, I guess. And, we're going to create that as a Postgres database. Now, of course, you're going to tell me uh, I've forgotten all about SQL, um, SQL Light, which I haven't. Um, but we um, have to worry about that in a minute. Um, okay. Right. I'm not sure if you can use MakeShed. So MakeShed would have been really nice in the constructor. I don't think we could use make shared if it's not in the constructor. And I don't really want to waste any more time on this. Uh, polish can be always be done later. Um, uh, we could easily just do um, database equals boost shared pointer of the database, blah blah blah, something like this. Here we don't need any of that. And then Some const somewhere. So apparently, we are no viable conversion from boost share pointer of ODB database to const std shared pointer. Now just be careful here that we're not. Yes. Sometimes we just, well, which makes me wonder if uh, my theory that Mac shared were indeed correct. Sometimes you think of one thing and it's just you jumping to conclusions. Let's just see what happens if I do a Mac shared again.
doesn't look too bad. Let me make sure it does work. Sometimes this is another problem of programming, I think. You sometimes you start reaching conclusions. You think, uh, you see what you want to see, I guess, is the right way of putting it in English. Um, just have to be careful. It's just you're tired or you're not really focusing properly. Um, right, so now we created a database, so that's nice. And then we can create transactions in the database. Created a run here. And I guess we just need to see how one would, I don't know, write it, but write something. Okay, um, again, I must not waste too much time, this is the I should have kept that, um, kept that open. So in here Well actually do you know what? Instead of using this project we should probably shouldn't be showing this. Not that it's a very important project, I haven't really done much work on it, but let's just look at the official ADV documentation. Um this is the right thing to do really. Updating persistent objects, presumably inserting. Uh, in fact, I'll go as far as saying this seems like you just need to do a db.insert run t.commit. Of course, uh, and our database is called database, not db. And it's a pointer, so we can't just do that. But the transaction is called t, and we can commit. <coughs> okay, I'm going to insert, so persist. If there's only an update, we just need to find how we can map the other world example. So that's the type that ODB uses generating database support, compiling and running. This is what all of the agenda does for you. Uh, but database that persists, I wonder what that does. Okay, perhaps that. Um, well, okay, let's see what happens. I guess first we need to compile this. Okay. <coughs> so we're missing a few things here. Right, so it seems to be the problem is we need a whole lot of includes. Now, normally the database is here. So, yes, I think what we did is, in our copying and pasting, we made a typo here. We meant to say we want to allocate a Postgres database, otherwise we just have a generic database. Um, right, so now in here we need to make sure that we include everything from ODB. So if you look at the includes here, it's the ODB headers, database and transaction we have, then the Postgres database, uh, sorry, Postgres in our case, and then we need two headers. So presumably that's what Dogen generated for us, which is run ODB AJAXX and run ODB PGSQL AJAXX. Is there anything else for run? So we have an HXX and IXX SQLite. Um, that looks about right, doesn't it? 
presumably if I look at the HXX, it will hopefully include the IXX. That's correct. So that, that looks about right actually. Um, not entirely sure what ODB is moaning. Um, ah, one thing we keep in, need to keep in mind is we included the Postgres one. Now ODB is very peculiar about this sort of thing. Um, not entirely sure if we should have included both of these. Let's put this in the right order at any rate. Um, not entirely sure which one we should include. Perhaps not both. Okay, that doesn't seem to have made any difference. This would. It's just that uh, it's not quite as complicated as it may seem. It's just that I don't use it to be very often, and so when I uh, stop using it, I forget about these details. Um, ODB is a very, very powerful tool. Uh, unfortunately, for this agent, uh, where you have five seconds to master something and you need to get going to the next task, um, it's not exactly the most easy thing to to learn in five minutes. Um, as you can see, I mean, Boris has done an incredible job here in documentation. And we aspire really to have this kind of documentation somewhere. But um, the problem with this is that you need time to really work through the examples and to understand what's going on. Um, and to, to just then do the right thing. It's not very forgiving if you don't, um, if you don't know what you're doing, ODB. So what I tend to do is I tend to just basically always revert back to my, uh, my example. Uh, I'm just going to keep it open here on the other side. Um, because, uh, as I say, ODB is not particularly forgiving. If you don't know what you're doing, it doesn't really uh, help you that much. It just expects you to know what you're doing. Um, so, let me just quickly check my previous projects. I'll just keep it side by side so I can see and uh, compare. So this is going off screen for a second. I'm also worried I may have some passwords and stuff in here that I don't want to reveal. Um, at least until I make this project open source. So I'm presumably just loading up the project. Right, so in this particular case, we seem to just include the ODB header and then all of its dependencies. Now, let's just make sure what it's complaining about because there are many types here and it could be that it's not the run type that's causing the problem. Try to persist run. Definitely included. So in our example that we did in the past, we literally ended up including the Ajax axis for every single type. Interestingly enough, we didn't particularly care about the Postgres specific ones, so I wonder if that's because we didn't have Postgres in other databases. So we look. Sorry for going off screen, but uh, just slightly unsure as to what I've done here before and what I got in this uh, project, so just to avoid problems, particularly if there's passwords. Ah, yes, yeah, so we didn't really have Postgres specific, we just had one database, so everything was Postgres. So uh, that, that I think we should probably include both the run ODB and the run uh, ODB Postgres. I think that's alright. Um, I just don't know why. Yeah, the problem is with run, clearly. And he's looking for an object traits import for run. Now, 
there's nothing else for run that we need to include. Run should also include all of the dependent types if Dojan did his job. So if I look here for run, JSON, and ID, and so forth, that's very nice. Dojan does all of that for us. So, what else could be missing here? Let's go back to that example. And sometimes what it is missing is just something silly about the ODB headers. We got both transaction and core in the specific database. Uh, this is diff. So, oh, interesting. We have database, but not the generic database. Well, presumably Postgres would include that, but hey, good measure. We must have transaction. We do. Um. Seem to have more noise coming from downstairs, but this on pause for a second. It's just yet another call. Um, I would like to, uh, before I break, I'd like to at least finish this uh, uh, compilation. But um, it's proving a little bit elusive. One thing that annoys me about Clang D is that we don't seem to, uh, whenever we compile, uh, we don't seem to get some of the template errors. I'm not sure why. So, yeah, that's pretty much all the headers you can see. We are missing, <coughs> excuse me, we're missing some ODB error, uh, uh, sorry, header. I don't think we're going to be able to solve this now, I'm afraid. I'm being called for uh, something else. So we might have to leave this for the next video, but it's a shame because we we're so close to actually connecting to the database. This is actually a really silly thing. There will be some kind of an include that we're missing. Right, okay, I'm, so I'm afraid I'm going to call it a day because this could take a while now. So let me just uh, take this opportunity to just uh, pause the video, stop the video here. So in conclusion, we started working on the relational model. Um, we tried to get some very, very simple uh, connectivity to the database. Um, we've created some kind of interfaces with lots of hackery, um, forgive the hackery for now, just to enable us to do um, simultaneously file tracing and relational tracing. And we were just about to test connecting to the database when we started getting some really strange ODB errors. Um, and that requires a little bit of thinking. I'll try to continue this uh, later on, part 15. Thanks for watching.